from Africa to South America to the South Pacific, a new kind of mercenary is stalking the globe. But these are not the traditional dogs of war, more an advance army for commercial interests. It was an outrageous plot that ended in humiliating capture. Simon Mann, of the privileged English background, would spend five years in some of Africa's most notorious prisons. Still, sometimes you might have to think because you can't take a prisoner because it's your risk of death. But everybody takes their own chance. You don't have security, you don't attract foreign investment, your economy doesn't, and your, your economy and your infrastructure doesn't develop. Simon, how are you, sir? I'm good, thanks. You're in Joburg, did you say? I am in Joburg, yeah. Wow. Lovely weather, no lockdown, it's fine. <laughs> oh, wow. Yes, I was there when I went to work in Mozambique. We stopped, obviously our flight came into South Africa and um, we, oh, sorry. We, we stayed at a lodge there in Joburg called Brown Sugar. Have you ever heard of it? No, no. Oh, it was, uh, let's just say one night in Johannesburg is as good as one night in Bangkok. <laughs> okay, really? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not so many girls, but well, not, not where we were. Um, but yes, yeah, so it was quite a memorable, uh, a member memorable occasion. As you can see from the background, I'm in a very nice house in Santon, so. Yes. Yes, <laughs> I had a great time there. And I'm of that age. I grew up seeing the, um, what you call, I don't know what you call it, the uprising on television. So the Zulus um, reacting against the security forces. Yeah. Um, our young people listening might be surprised, but our news every night was filled filled with people running down the road with spears, chasing after the the, the police or, or and the police firing off their firing off their baton rounds. Um, yes, incredible. So when I got to Johannesburg, Simon, it was quite. I don't think emotional is the right word, but it was certainly a um, a special moment to see a place that had been so much in, 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 in my history, in my youth. And to see the big mind dumpings, mm. just incredible. Yeah, well, I, I'm actually half South African. So my mother was South African and I have a South African passport. So I'm very familiar with what you're talking about. <laughs> and um, yeah, quite amazing. I mean, you went to Eton, that's right. I did, yeah. Yeah, I gave a talk to Eaton the other day, funnily enough. Okay. <laughs> it's quite, very, very yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I never thought in my life I'd be talking to Eaton students, but they, they seem to appreciate the, uh, the re realism in what I said. Um, I mean, I know a bit about um, Africa's colonial history. You had some vicious fighting Mozambique obviously Angola yeah I just wondered how is it you know if you're half South African does that throw up issues or do you notice a sort of lack of well, I mean, it's um I mean the first time I came to South Africa uh, I was six and it was 1958 and we came by sea <laughs> And my grandparents obviously were living here. And so it's always been a part of my life that. Um, and I mean, I tend to find that, um, you know, we're all sons of the empire to a certain degree, one, you know, more or less. Very few English people have no connection with any part of the old empire. 
mm. you know, cousins in Canada, cousins in Australia, this, that, something or other. And I think pro pro probably not so much now, but certainly my generation was very much the norm, I think. You know, the people who were born in India, their fathers had served in the Indian army or God knows what, but there were loads and loads of that sort of, uh, those sort of connections. And um, it's actually a bit of a hobby horse of mine because what I find in Africa is an enormous um, residual goodwill towards the UK. And funnily enough, that is as strong, sometimes stronger in the non-British colonies because they had the misfortune of being colonized by somebody else. <laughs> mm. Yes, it, there's such rich history in Africa. Um, I've read a lot of Wilbur Smith's books. I don't know what his reputation is over there, but it certainly gives you a flavor of the depth of history that, that, that there is there. Oh yeah, I'm a big Wilbur Smith fan. Yeah. I, I actually thought that they were sort of training manuals for a while. <laughs> yes, yes. Were you, were you living in England when you joined the army? Ah, uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. No, so we never, well, actually, no, that's not true. I mean, but as a, as in terms of how I was brought up, I didn't live in South Africa. I think the longest I was here continuously was uh, 18 months. Mm. Um, in fact, went to live in South Africa in 1997 and we lived there for six years which was great we lived in Cape Town mm. um, so uh, I didn't live here as as a boy yeah and you were Scots Guards is that right I was yes yeah, Scots yeah. Guards yeah absolutely was uh, it which is a bit strange because not even slightly Scottish <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah uh, my yeah. grandfather joined um, Scots Guards in the First World War, and that's, that's why it became family regiment. Uh, I see. Is that usual if you come out of Sandhurst that you can go to any... I mean, you could go to the Gurkhas, right? Well, yeah, I mean, certainly in my day, um, so now we're talking a, a quite a long time ago, so sort of 1969, I mean, you, when you went to Sandhurst, it, which I did, because in those days there were Santas and Mons. And Santas was regular officers, uh, Mons was short service. I wanted to go to Santas, become a regular officer. And um, you kind of pretty much sort of um, book your place with your regiment, probably before you went to Santas. You know, you knew where you wanted to go and you would have had an interview with them before you went to Santas. And so they they would sometimes reject people and they'd say, well, you know, good luck at Santas, but we don't think you're what we want. Um, that obviously didn't happen to me, but that could happen. And um, so it was a whole sort of jockeying, you know, and also even then there were only a limit, there were, there were a fixed number of places that the regiments could fill. So if they had too many people wanting to come in, then, um, you know, they couldn't take them all. Although that definitely wasn't the case with the Scots Guards in my day. We were very badly recruited for officers. And the SAS for an officer, I'm assuming the selection is the same as, as the men, is that right? Uh, yeah, you do the, you do the same. Um, you have to get a better grade than they do on test week. And then you do officers week, which is an extra sort of bolt on especially for you, <laughs> uh, which is Officers Week was hard. Wow. What, what's hard about it? I'm guessing uh, physical. Well, no, it's because you'll, well, in my case, we just finished um, Test Week, you come straight off Test Week onto Officers Week. So you're, you're, you're tired anyway. So they've achieved that. You're absolutely knackered. Um, the difficult part about it that I found is that um, on, uh, on test week, it's, a, it's purely objective. I mean, you've just got to make the times, you know, you, you've just got to make those times mm. and get the grade. And that's on the watch and on the paper. Um, officers week is much more about whether they like you or not as an officer. 
And so it's quite hard not to um, start trying to second guess it, if you know what I mean? So they ask you a question or they throw something at you and you're, instead of just reacting, you're thinking, oh, what do they want me to say? You know, what, <laughs> what am I meant to say? And which of course is uh, potentially fatal. <laughs> yes. Was it always on the cards you were going to go on selection? Was that your goal from the beginning? Yeah, it was actually. My cousin, uh, Lockie McLean, was um, in the SAS uh, in the 60s. Um, and I mean, he, he went to Borneo, served in Borneo, his guards independent parachute company, then um, SAS. In fact, he was one of the founding troop commanders of G Squadron for SAS historians. <laughs> um, and uh, so I was at school and hearing about my cousin's exploits and I thought, right, this is what I want to do. Wow. And I've seen pictures of you in the Northern Ireland conflict, haven't I? Might have done. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I did a lot of tours. Wow. In fact, I did the um, at Sandhurst. I did the the what was called the Edward Bear course, which was the you, you basically did the parachute course as an officer cadet. Mm. So I did that um, for fun, basically. I mean, you volunteered for it, and then uh, of course you do parachute training in the SAS. Everybody does. Yeah, you do a lot of it, don't you? Quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, it depends because if you're a free faller. You know, if you're in free fall troop, each squadron has a free fall troop. And so obviously, if you're a free faller, then you do a hell of a lot of it. Mm. Uh, the rest of us sort of muddle along. And the funny thing was that what the one thing that the free fallers absolutely hated was static line, which is what we all were doing. <laughs> you know, they were fine jumping out at 20,000 feet at night, with oxygen and a bergen on their legs. And oh, my God, I don't know how they did it. Mm. But... You say to them, okay, we're going to jump at 600 feet on a, on a static line. They say, oh, my God, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> yes. I did two parachute courses. The first one, we got as far as the balloon jump, and then it was cancelled because all the Hercules went out to the, the first Gulf War. Right. Um, but I shared my room with two SES guys, um, and they were probably like the two most humble people I've ever met I think that might surprise a lot of people but you just would not know you just would not know that these guys were the you know the elite of the elite <laughs> no so, some of the guys are very surprising there was one one time where um they were bimbling along I think we were going to 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 what you guys would call scoff what we call scran and um the RSN came out. He went, you two, put your effing berries on now. <laughs> and these two troopers just went. <laughs> and carried on walking. It was... <laughs> <laughs> Is he talking to us? <laughs> yeah, well, they were like, you know, nobody talks to us that way. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, that's... Uh... I remember when I did my my parachute course the second one time I did it with the uh, which was with the SAS and um, I you know obviously I don't think I need to say that but as a young officer you're pretty nervous and the the parachute course is at the end of your SAS selection and continuation and it's almost like a sort of holiday really because you know you've been through the whole thing and now you're you've got two weeks away from camp and you're just gonna you know do these do these jumps which we'd all done before anyway and um the so the we were with i don't know 40 or 50 parachute regiment recruits and they really were parachute regiment recruits uh you know they'd just done p company and now they're going to do their their jumps and so i think there were about eight or nine of us sas guys on this course with these 40 or 50 parachute regiment guys and um, I think we'd done the first jump from the aircraft and the, the, the SAS guys formed up to me as the Rupert and said, right, boss, listen, um, we want you to go and talk to the commandant of this place 
because we're not going to jump with those beep, diddy, beep, beep, beeps again. <laughs> and I said, well, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, they're, they're just dangerous because they're so gung-ho. All they want to do is charge out the back of that aeroplane. There's no thought of timing between the doors, you know, left, right, left, right. And uh, we don't want to jump with them. So I thought, oh, God, now what? You know, so anyway, I have to go and form up to the uh, RAF commanding officer, I think tell him the situation he looked at me and he said you know what simon i don't blame them and i don't blame you it's fine you'll all jump as your own stick <laughs> <laughs> it was quite funny yes as a marine i always had to make sure i was the first one out because we we had a load of baby powers in with us as as well and so you know you know exactly what i'm talking about oh, there was one time in the balloon um they say right number off so i'm like one you know just my arm was straight straight up so basically for friend our friends listening that means you're first in the door and uh he said right number one to the door and i stepped forward his arms across the reserve and um i just turned around and said i'll see you guys on the ground geronimo <laughs> <laughs> like that. and then when i caught up with them in the hangar i said uh, yeah did you think it was funny when i said i'll see you guys on the ground they said actually chris we were just shitting ourselves didn't no. really didn't really hear what you said <laughs> <Didn't hear> you. <laughs> yeah gosh great experience throwing yourself out of airplanes yeah no i preferred airplanes to the balloon actually i must admit so there was something very clinical about the balloon jump. Yeah, it's like it, it, it's all well. It's it's a base jump technically, isn't it? Which is kind of it, it all seems so much more serious if it's going to open or not. Because mm. if it doesn't, you haven't really got much height to rectify it. No, and in the aeroplane, you've got all that noise and the smell and the shouting and the and the sort of the whole stick going out and all of that. Whereas the balloon, it's very quiet. There you go, off you go, sir, kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, very different. And then, of course, you're going to fall straight down. You're not going to go sideways with the movement of the aircraft. They took the balloon up to 4 5 commando, and the guys were just giving their mates their, their woolly pulleys with their para wings on and going, Go on, you go for it. And um, <laughs> there's guys going out doing backflips and somersaults, and the PGA, PJIs are saying, are you sure that guy's paratrained? <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, that, that was quite funny on the, um, what they used to call stud splash, you know, jumping into Studland Bay. Uh, oh, okay. And uh, we, we used to do that because I was a boat crew. Um, and so we were, did quite a lot of water stuff with pool, actually. We were down there quite a lot. And um, in those days, they used to allow non paratrained civilians to jump off the tailgate of the C-130 into the sea, because why not? You know, what, what can possibly go wrong? But it turned out that actually quite a lot could possibly go wrong <laughs> because one guy dropped his reserve, you know, said it, so when he, when he released one side of the reserve, he didn't release one side of the reserve, he released both sides of the reserve, but I mean, it's about 500 feet up. So this reserve comes down and the, uh, the booties in the, in the Geminis were sort of laughing. So I had to make sure they didn't land on them. And then the next guy that came out uh, misjudged the distance completely. And I don't know what height he was when he fell out of his harness, but quite high, mm, yeah. <laughs> high enough for everyone to go, ooh. <laughs> yeah, the things you do when you're young. <laughs> mm. yeah. well, it was pretty good fun. I loved it. How has it been a a help or or a hindrance, Simon? Being you, I mean, you're tagged with mercenary everywhere you go, or well, obviously throughout social media. Is is how how have you found that? Well, that's a pain um, because you know mercenary is a fairly pejorative. Um, word among, for most people and um, 
it's it's a sort of pointless debate because you know you can talk about what is a mercenary all day long and uh, some people would say well any professional soldier surely is a mercenary and then you have well no well, no because that's for queen and country really well a Gurkha isn't you know he doesn't come from here so is he a mercenary and 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 that whole debate is completely pointless really um and so i sort of avoid it and um in fact, on LinkedIn, for those who follow LinkedIn, I've been arguing that we ought to be called condottieri, which is the Italian for mercenary, and it just sounds so much better. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of funny to place you even in that scene, because, I mean, I've had guys I was in the Marines with, they've gone out and they've done you know, security on diamond mines in Africa or Angola. And it, it's not unusual for guys to come out of an elite force or a special force and go and do that line of work, isn't it? Not, not really caring what the parameters of the, 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 or the politics are, but if there's a big paycheck at the end of it. But you, you am I right in thinking you were more um trying to do the right thing or was there an uh, element I mean, of, was there an element of i'm going to get paid a lot for this as well no i mean it, it it's a, it's it's you know it's I, you know i've written a book you know i've got a book called yes. cry house um actually funny enough it's behind me this is my friend's house but this is actually the book's actually somewhere up in there oh, i'm going to put a link for it under our video simon okay cool yeah well, it's, um, and so, I mean, basically, I rejoined, I mean, without telling and having to tell the whole story again, but I mean, I rejoined the British Army uh, because of the first Gulf War, and I was on the staff of Peter de la Villiers, and that all came to an end in February uh, 92, and um, I, I was offered an, a, a job back in the Special Air Service, actually, arranged by Peter, because I was on a TA attachment to do my service with him. And um, they would convert it back to being a um, regular commission, blah, blah, blah. And then Tony Buckingham at the same time started Heritage Oil and Gas, which I would actually helped him a little bit with, and said, no, come on, you know, you've, you've done the whole army thing. It's time you made some proper money. Come and join me in Heritage. I said, OK, I, I really actually probably ought to try and do that and make some proper money. And um, lo and behold, what was it, about seven months later, I was a general in the Angolan army at war. <laughs> so my attempt at becoming a civilian was an abject failure. Um, and the reason we got into, we were in that position was because basically UNITA, who were the guerrillas, having signed an agreement and having made all sorts of promises, uh, went against their agreement and against their promises, and they went back to war, having lost the elections of November '92. It was a really big deal because I mean that was that was what got the Russians and the Cubans and the South Africans and the Americans all out of Angola, all in the lead up to that election. Long story. Anyway, they went back to war, and the first thing they did was they attacked our operating base, which is a place called Soyo on the mouth of the river Congo. And um, we decided that we would fight back, that we wouldn't just say, okay, we're going home and pack our bags. We thought, no, you know, these guys are committing a huge crime against humanity going back to war. They signed an agreement, they made a peace treaty, they've got no right to go back to war whatsoever. And they're attacked, they've attacked us, you know, our men, our kit, our livelihood, um, to hell with them. Uh, so we pitched, a, pitched the idea to the Angolans, they liked it, and that was effectively the beginning of executive outcomes. I mean, executive outcomes existed before that, but hadn't done anything of that sort at all. Um, and the next thing, we're in a pitch battle to recapture Soyo, which is all quite well known, quite well documented. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it wasn't like a deliberate decision to go and fight or 
uh, become a security guy, it was actually the opposite. I was hoping I was going to become an oil and gas man, <laughs> but um, it wasn't. It, that wasn't going to. It wasn't to be. And so um, the whole mercenary thing there is quite annoying in a way because you know how are we mercenaries? You know, we we firstly we're acting almost in self defence. We're acting in on behalf of our company and our livelihood. And secondly. We're like Gurkhas because we were all signed up into the Angolan Armed Forces. You know, I had an ID card, badges of rank, all the rest of it. Mm. So that doesn't normally fulfill the mercenary, you know, definition. Yeah. My gosh. So yeah. So I, 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 I see. And how did you go from there to the Equatorial Guinea situation? Oh, well, that was much later. So the, the Angolan stuff all happened in 93. So that's when, it, that's when Executive Outcomes really started as a uh, mercenary company. Um, and I think it's important to actually differentiate between you know, private security company, private military company, and what Executive Outcomes was. Because you know, a lot of these, what they call PMCs, what are they actually doing? You know, they're guarding an embassy, or they're escorting VIPs around, and yeah, if they get shot at, they'll shoot back, fine. But they don't go to a government and say, we'll help you win your war. We'll come and fight this war with you and we'll help you win it, which is what executive outcomes did. And that is a, a, a rather different thing. But anyway, while, while Angola was going on, we started Sierra Leone and shortly after that, or while that was going on, the Papua New Guinea happened, that big mess, and then the arms to Sierra Leone scandal, which resulted in the re resignation of Robin Cook, all of those dramas happened. And that was basically when I thought, well, I think I'll take the family down to Cape Town <laughs> and relax in the vineyards of Constantia, uh, which is what I did until 2003. And that was when I was recruited to do the Equatorial Guinea um, failed to attempt. Am I right in thinking you were tricked into or, or, or was it double crossed? No, it's, again, it's a long story, but you know, no, I was recruited to do it. I, I, thought, I said, yeah, I agreed to do it. I wanted to do it. And um, it went wrong, you know, and um, my mistake, my fault, I should have called it off, uh, but I didn't. And um, we were arrested. <laughs> How did Mark Thatcher get involved? What 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 did he what was he looking to get out of this? Well, how he got involved was that basically the guy who should have been backing the whole thing and um, driving the show, who is the guy who who is the guy who recruited me, it's a guy called Ellie Khalil, who's now dead, um, and he wasn't backing us properly. And basically, the whole thing was going to fail. It was just going to be. It was just going to fall apart. Not going to happen. And I needed two hundred thousand. Um, dollars to keep the show on the road and I thought well who is who is crazy enough to just you know write out a check for two hundred thousand dollars to be a part of this and to make this happen and uh, Mark was you know a friend really I mean sort of more of an acquaintance than a friend but he was a friend in a way down in Cape Town and you know we used to have dinner parties together and all that business but I didn't really know him that well but I thought, yeah, well, I think Mark would love to do this. So, so he joined in, signed up, paid his 200000 And then when the shit hit the fan, wham, he got absolutely clobbered. Yes, I bet. I, when you were arrested, in, was it Harare Airport? So you're on your way to Equatorial Guinea. Uh, yeah, that's right. And you were going to pick up a, your, your weapons in in Zimbabwe. Harare, yeah. Yeah. So how did how did that play out? And at what point did you think, oh shit? It's <laughs> yeah, well actually I'd been there for a few days because what we were doing was collecting the arms and ammunition, as you say. And the aeroplane came in, my lovely Boeing 727, which we just bought, um, and with the men on board. And the idea was we would you know, they were just going to stop, load the stuff on, and away we go. And um, I went to collect, actually check over the weapons, and got onto the back of a truck. And there was 
there were very few weapons there. And I thought, oh, hmm, something's really wrong here. And then I heard this voice saying, get down from the truck. And uh, that's it. We were, we were under arrest. Oh, my God. Did they arrest all, all, all of your men? Oh, yeah. Yeah, everyone went to prison. Uh, the men for 18 months, a year or 18 months, in, depending, in uh, Harare, Chikarubi Max, Chick Max. They call it the Harare Hilton. Yeah. <laughs> These places get the tag Hilton, don't they? It's mm, like, yeah. Not a good I'm place. I'm guessing ironically. Um, and where did you recruit those guys from? Were, were they a, you know, were they a ragtag bunch of bandits or were they all? No, no, they were all from executive outcome. Hmm. Almost without exception. Yeah. And where did executive outcomes recruit from mainly? Was it ex paras and Marines? No, executive outcomes was almost exclusively uh, ex South African Defence Force, either parachute, parabat or recce, which is their equivalent of special forces. But many of them were from the notorious 3 2 battalion. Because I mean, 80% of executive outcomes were black. And those guys came from 3 2 battalion, who were basically people who the South Africans recruited in Angola to fight for the South Africans against the MPLA, the then Angolan government. Actually, still the Angolan government, but yeah. It's a complicated and long story. I mean, Angola was the worst, um, Angola was the worst and, and most intense proxy war of the entire Cold War. And it was real war. I mean, the, you know, heavy artillery, fighters, dogfighting, tanks, etc. Um, and most people actually in the UK are pretty ignorant of the whole thing. Hmm. They don't even know where Angola is, most people. But it was a major war. Yes. Well, they saw that. I mean, they had it bad, didn't they? The back in. Uh, I mean, originally Portugal didn't want to give its colonies up, so there was a brutal fight there. Then they had all the the civil war again. It's just. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, so the poor old Angolans. I mean, actually, this was one of the reasons I was so angry when UNITA went back to war. Mm. You know, I was past it. I, was, I just thought it was an outrageous thing to do because, as you say, they'd had this incredibly long war. They'd fought against the Portuguese. There were about three or four different factions who fought against the Portuguese. The Portuguese packed it up and ran away in 76 when they had their own coup in Portugal, if you remember. And then the civil war started, um, which was MPLA backed by Russia and Cuba uh, yeah, against yeah. UNITA, the guerrillas, backed by the United States and South Africa. And I knew Zavimbi. I mean, I actually spent four hours with Zavimbi talking about the whole thing, the whole story. And he promised, I was with Lord Steele, the liberal, uh, you know, the leader of the house in Scotland, um, David Steele, mm. is a very good guy. And he and I went and saw um, Zavimbi. We spent four hours with them. I mean, the only reason I saw Zavimbi because I was with Lord Steele. I mean, <laughs> Zavimbi wouldn't have seen me otherwise. But I was the I was sort of David Steele's bag carrier. But actually, I was a little bit more than that because we were uh, we wanted to um, we wanted to make sure that if Zavimbi won, the oil company that I was by then working for would be still regarded as friendly. Yeah, you know, the whole thing there about him and he, he, he looked us in the eye and he, I actually don't think Unita intended to go back to war. I think they were pushed back into it. I don't think it was their decision. Well, there's massive wealth in that part of the world, isn't it? The massive, yeah. massive natural resources and... Well, I, yeah, I mean, Angola is just the most incredible country. I mean, it's three times the size of France. You've got oil, um, copper, gold, diamonds, fish in the sea, fantastic farmland. I mean, it's just the most fabulous place. Mm. Yes, and and uh, destroyed by years of civil war. I mean, how many landmines must be in the ground there? Would... Yeah, I mean, you know, they are they are working their way through it. Mm. 
they're, they're sorting it out slowly but surely. Simon, I'm conscious of your your time here. Can you just give us an idea of what was it like in a foreign prison and what what mindset <laughs> what mindset do you have to adopt? Uh, yeah, um, the mindset um, thing is uh, is pretty important. But, you know, people come to me and they say, oh, well, you know, it doesn't compare with you, but I actually spent two weeks in a jail in, you know, wherever, Burkina Faso or something. And, uh, but of course, that's nothing like what you had to do. I said, no, 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 it's fine. One day is a day too many. Mm. You know, your two weeks would have been hell. <laughs> so it's, I understand exactly what you're talking about. And, um, I mean, one of the sort of weird things about it is that um, it's almost it's a double punishment or even a treble punishment in a sense, because, you know, I'm sure UK prisons are not all that pleasant, um, although some of them look pretty good. Um, but your family can come and visit you. You know, my family couldn't come and visit me. And... Also, if you make a joke with your fellow prisoners about, you know, what a load of rubbish a certain football team is, they will understand it. If you're in um, Zimbabwe, they don't. And so you're in a kind of exile. You know, you're, hot, you're in a cultural exile. And I think that makes it much harder. And then, of course, when I got to Equatorial Guinea, because, you know, I did two, so I did four years um, in, in Chikarubi, in Harare, and then I was kind of kidnapped out of that prison, and I was smuggled to Equatorial Guinea, where they put me in Black Beach there. And in Black Beach, I was in solitary confinement, in you know, strict solitary confinement, uh, for 18 months. God. That's, like, that's either character building or <laughs> character breaking, isn't it? Uh, yeah, <laughs> probably. But I mean, you've got no choice. So you just got to. What did they it. feed? What did they feed you? Um, oh, well, in Zim, they just feed you sadza, which is, um, you know, boiled up mealy meal. Sadza in the evening and what they call bota, which is the same meal, but cooked a different way. Um, the porridge in the morning. And that's it, basically. Uh, but luckily, um, having a, a super wife and family, I had extra food. Oh, they could subsidise you, could they? Yeah, so, you know, that I get some tins of sardines or something like that. And Simon, if I may say so, um, you look remarkably healthy for... <laughs> are you, you 70 now? Is it, would that be right? No, 68. Yeah. My God, you're, you're out doing, well, a lot of guys in their 50s, I'd say. <laughs> well, I try and run every day. Um, I really try and keep fit. Yeah. What are your times like? Do you find them slipping as you get older? Or you... Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. I try and stick to this thing that you should be able to do 10Ks in the same number of minutes as you are old in years. Ah, uh, Okay. Now, obviously, if you're 25, that's going to be extremely difficult. <laughs> but it's, it's quite a good benchmark as you get older. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not particularly good at doing maths on the spot, but I'll have to work that out. I'm, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm running 200 miles this month. Oh, my God. Right. Okay. Yes. One of these silly things that I do. I'm, I'm, I've got this project called Running Homeless for Christmas. Okay. And I'm just going to hit my running track and just run 200 miles. And if I can do it in two days, great. Then I, then I get home for Christmas Eve. If I don't, then I'm, I'm out for the, for the long run. I'm, I want to um, just do what I can to highlight the veterans plight, the, the amount of our, our service personnel that, that um, suffer with trauma and, and subsequently mm. housing problems. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I hope that day doesn't come when, <laughs> when, I, when I can't keep pretending I'm 21. 
yeah no well that, it will <laughs> i mean I, i'm i'm very lucky but i find now you know you get an injury you pick up a minor injury like a tweaked knee you know which back in the day would have cured quickly and now it sort of stays with you you can't run for quite a while and then that that means you know when you do start running again you've got to be very careful you don't pick up another injury and you know it just you know you just got to be quite a lot more careful yes i bet body management yeah but i think it's also the same you know with the with the whole mental health thing as well you know i think the guys um some of the guys have a real problem with asking for help and sort of you know understanding that they can't do what they used to be able to do you, you know because we all you got your background my background we all set set such an incredibly high um uh we, we set very very high standards for ourselves mm. of fitness of mental toughness and all the rest of it and i think you know that that becomes dangerous actually as you as you get older you don't want help you don't want to tell anybody you're not feeling well and um, and that is a real issue i think yes very much so anyone out there struggling there's phone numbers at the bottom of my youtube video that you can reach out and talk to somebody yeah you've got to do it you know i mean i get asked um you know well how how, how is your mental health you know 18 months in solitary confinement i mean that's meant to sort of send anybody around the twist I mean, and i say well you don't ask me <laughs> <laughs> I might be think I'm Napoleon and everything's fine. You know? <laughs> but um, I, I, I did a talk actually to the um, SDS um, uh, Regimental Association just before uh, the first, just before Christmas actually, and um, I knew that the association wanted me to talk about the whole business of sort of um, you know asking for help. Um, and uh, I, I thought, God, I cannot stand up in front of them and tell them they've got to ask for help. You know, that's, that's not, that's not going to work. So I, um, I turned it around completely and I cited two people who I knew were heroes to the audience, you know, all SAS guys. David Sterling, who I really knew quite well, and Peter de la Bilia, who I also really knew quite well and worked for, well, I worked for both of them actually on different occasions. And um, I said, you know, the amazing thing about both those guys is that anybody fit, feels, felt with them that uh, they could go and talk to them. Considering who they were, they were fantastically approachable. So if somebody wanted to ask for help, they would accept that 100% and they would uh, welcome it. And I thought my idea was that by turning it around, I got the same message across to the guys without sounding patronizing. <laughs> you know. Yes. It's true, though, because both of those guys are incredibly approachable. Do you know Damien Lewis? No, I don't. Uh, Damien writes a lot of SAS type um uh, memoirs, not 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 personal memoirs, but a, but about the um, a regiment. Okay. And um, yeah, we were just. He came on the podcast the other day. He's a very famous author. And um, yeah, no, I've I've seen his book. Yeah, he was saying how much um, like the amount of trauma somebody like Paddy Main must have accumulated in during their service with the you know the the untold acts of of uh warfare that he was involved in and how back then you you just had the drink and you you didn't have this thing where you could reach out to people um yeah it's quite yeah, close. I, that I, I agree with you and i was actually quite what was that book called um SES Heroes, the one it was a big success uh, was it two or three years ago. I can't actually remember the name of the title, but it was the official, it was an official history of the SAS in the war. And I was shocked how much they were drinking at the time. Mm. <laughs> Never mind afterwards. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. uh, but Paddy Main, in fact, actually at the dinner 
that I did this talk I just talked about just now, mentioned just now, um, there was a guy there who who had served in two SAS in the war. And uh, he said, well, I was lucky. I didn't have to do selection like you all did. He said, really? You didn't do selection? He's, he said, no, no, we didn't do selection those days. I just got interviewed by Paddy Main. <laughs> and I said, well, I think, I think actually probably selection would be easier than being interviewed by Paddy Main. <laughs> yes. I got a feeling a bottle of whiskey came into that interview. That's the benchmark. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. I must admit, I've got let just lately. Um, people have asked me about uh, you know the lockdown and all this, the, the whole COVID nineteen thing, and um, so so what do you think about it? And what what I mean, what do you think Colonel David would have thought about what? You know? I said, well. I don't think he would re have regarded stay safe as a very good way of saying goodbye to people. Stay safe. <laughs> yes. That's a there's whole nothing, other... There's nothing safe about him. <laughs> no. It's amazing that you know him. I mean, he's, he's obviously legend, legendary David Sterling. Totally, absolutely amazing guy. I mean, just incredible guy. I was, in, I was very, very lucky to get to know him actually quite well. Yeah. So, I mean, I it, wasn't, it wasn't entirely luck, actually, because I sort of blagged my way in and, you know, got to know him and started working for him. But I kind of cold called him, <laughs> which was uh, an interesting moment. But anyway. Yeah. Sounds like you can get away with that sort of thing in the SAS. I appreciate the... The well, that was the thing. He really was very approachable. And the first time I met him, I was absolutely terrified. You know, I knew who he was. I was a very young officer in the Scots Guards and I was very bored. You know, I'd been to Northern Ireland twice and I, that was a pain in the ass. And I knew, I knew he was up to all sorts of interesting things. And I went in and see him in his beautiful office above Goods in um, South Audley Street. 22 South Audley Street, so it's 22, the address is 22 SAS. And lovely office, went in, and it was evening, there was no lights, and this great big desk, beautiful office, and he's sitting there, and he said, oh, come in, come in, come in. sit down. Yeah. I'm just about to light a cigar, but it's the last one. But I haven't lit it yet. I'll tell you what, I'll toss you for it. <laughs> and it's just, it's just a stupid small thing, but he had the gift that he could put someone at ease, you know. Mm. Yes, a, a leader of men. Absolutely amazing guy, yeah. So I, thank you ever so much for your time. It's been a fascinating chat. Um, you're, I'm gonna put the, all your links, I'll put, what should I put your LinkedIn, li uh, LinkedIn page I can put yeah, just LinkedIn, because I don't really do the others. Yeah. And, and uh, you can mention the book if you like. Yeah. But I mean, uh, you know, long, long gone. And will you send me the send me the link so I can put them on my LinkedIn as well? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. And um, let's chat again if that's okay. That would be that would be my pleasure. Sure. Well, that's fine. No, and I, I enjoyed it. My pleasure too. Yes. Take care. Speak soon. All right then. Thanks, Simon. Cheers, that. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hello, friend. I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Thrall. I'm a former Royal Marines Commando, and I fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction to live, work, and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now, I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life and if you live it right, one is enough.